Hello and welcome to Sensei Podcast. This is Manos Brilakis discussing with leaders in the field of CTO and complex PCI. Sensei means teacher or master in Japanese. The goal of the Sensei Podcast is to help you learn and improve in CTO and complex PCI so that you can become the best that you can be and offer your patients the best possible results. Hello and welcome to this next episode of the Sensei Podcast. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jay Katri, who is the Director of Complex Coronary Interventions at the Cleveland Clinic. Jay, good morning and again, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Manos. Thank you for this amazing opportunity. I, I feel uh, unworthy to be among such esteemed colleagues, but thank you for the invitation. No, it's it's a, it's a great pleasure, and again, you've done a lot of work on the on the area, both on the learning and the teaching. So we're very eager to learn uh, from you about how you learned and how people can uh, uh, use your experience to help with their uh, learning uh, trip uh, as we go along that route. So maybe give us a little background. How did this happen for you? Um, how did you start doing these complex interventions? How did this all come? Was it something you wanted to do as a child, or later on came? How, how was the trip from you? Yeah, it's an interesting journey, isn't it? I, I certainly had no plans on being an interventional cardiologist. It just sort of happened. Uh, I did a fourth year elective as a medical student with a cardiothoracic surgeon. Because I was sort of leaning towards that side of things. And this surgeon, um, I owe him my entire career, quite honestly, because he, he told me this is uh, 95. He told me, look, I want you to follow all the acute myocardial infarctions that arrive in ED and you follow them wherever they go. Your responsibility is to follow them from the ER to wherever they end up and then you report back to me at the end of the week. And I thought that was odd because I was like, well, what about your surgery schedule and who should we go around on? He says, no, 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 just go to the ER, follow the ER patients. And they all went to the cath lab and they all got acute PTCAs and they ended up in the CCU on heparin and 2P3As and and I follow these patients, and at the end of the week, I came back to him and said, look, I didn't do any surgery with you. Uh, what was the point of that rotation? He goes, well, did you learn? I said, yeah, I learned that uh, a lot of these patients can be taken care of without surgery, and he just smiled. <laughs> and honestly, that's how this started. Wow, that's a, a rare occurrence, I guess, right, that uh, the surgeon yeah, actually yeah, will point I mean, you towards the interventional. How visionary was that, right? Uh, to point a young medical student towards this burgeoning field of interventional cardiology. And we certainly did do surgery that month, but uh, it, it really opened my eyes and it led to a lot of late minute uh, readjustment of my residency applications, but uh, that's how it started. Wonderful. And where were you then at the time? I went to medical school in Northeast Ohio uh, and I was doing a rotation at a hospital that ended up becoming part of the Cleveland Clinic Health System as a smaller community hospital where they had a residency program and they invited medical students and so that's where I met this surgeon and learned all about the cath lab. And then, and then how did it go do, after you did your cardiology training, your interventional training, how did it end up uh, coming to you uh, and becoming again 360 and getting into interventions? Um, into, into CTO and uh, CHIP intervention? Well, it's it's an interesting story also because I happen to do fellowship with Dimitri Karmpaliotis and Bill Nicholson and several other great people in my class, but that was my class. So you can imagine um, there was a lot of uh, interest in pushing the envelope and learning as much as we could in that 12 months and a lot of camaraderie and a lot of internal competition and uh, it all made us so much better. It was an amazing experience and we had an opportunity when we were fellows at Emory to work with some Japanese operators that Emory had invited uh, to show us uh, some of the advanced techniques that were being developed in Japan at the time. This is 05, 06. And, um, you know, the big thing back then was carotid stenting. That was sort of where the big focus was in terms of uh, technology and technique. And this was very eye-opening because this was 
things that we had never seen before. They were clearly doing things that we didn't understand and really didn't appreciate. And they had wires and tools and ideas that were very, very new to us. And um, that really stuck with me. I, I left fellowship with sort of that in the back of my mind that, look, there's, there's this whole other area that I don't know that we have much of an exposure to in North America. And there's a lot to learn from operators outside of our immediate sphere. And that's sort of what started it. And um, being friends with Bill and Dimitri, we've always kept in touch and compared notes and talked about cases. And um, it just, that's how the journey started. And we, um, I personally, the, fir the first time I actually got to see CTOs done in North America was with Aaron Grantham. I, I went to visit his lab uh, maybe a year out of fellowship and I watched him do five cases. And this is before we had any of the advanced wires. There was no Corsair. Uh, but he had this really cool microcatheter called an Excelsior catheter, which is a neurointerventional catheter, and a really, really advanced Japanese wire called a run-through wire. <laughs> and uh, so I ordered these when I got home. And uh, I did a case. Uh, and now when I look back at it, it's sort of an astonishing case to do as your very first uh, advanced uh, PCI. I, I wired a right-to-right -right conus epicardial to a distal RCA CTO with a run-through wire and an Excelsior microcatheter, and then managed to wire retrograde back into aorta, and then ran out of ideas. I had no idea what to do. And I broke scrub, and I called Bill Nicholson, and he didn't pick up. I called Dimitri, and he didn't pick up. And then I quit. I actually pulled everything out and quit, and I waited for these guys to call me back, and we went over the films over the weekend, and uh, we made a pact at that point that, look, if during normal work hours, if one of us calls, there's a reason, and you need to pick up. It's not a social call. You have to pick up, and that's sort of how we started this sort of uh, post-training relationship of professional development, and it's never stopped. I mean, we've continued to do that ever since. So during work hours, if that phone rings and it's Nicholson or Carpoliotis, i got to pick up. Something's up. <laughs> Well, that's a good thing to know. <laughs> that's a, and that makes a huge difference, obviously, right? For this case and complex cases, and uh, having a second opinion yeah, always yeah. always helps. So, did you yeah, bring so the we, patient we back? What did happen in the end? Plan. Yeah, we came up with a plan, and I brought him back a month later. I repeated the whole process this time with an idea of how to externalize a wire with a snare, and uh, you know, I got the case done successfully, and uh, that sort of started this whole conversation. That, hey. We can do some of this stuff that we learn from the Japanese operators and the stuff that we're reading in these articles that are coming out from Japan, but we don't have uh, a lot of experience. And that's when Dimitri uh, was lucky enough to uh, uh, to get in touch with uh, Bill Lombardi. And um, Dimitri scheduled a bunch of cases uh, at his hospital in Atlanta and invited Bill Lombardi to come down to help Proctor. And Bill Nicholson and I flew down. We did cases for two days straight. And that started this amazing relationship with Bill Lombardi. He's been uh, obviously instrumental in a lot of our careers in terms of developing our uh, skill sets and, and our, uh, our knowledge base and how to do these things. So Bill Lombardi, thankfully, was available to come proctor us several times in Cleveland. Uh, Tony Demartini has been up to proctor us. Uh, at one point, I even had Dr. Ochai fly in from Japan and proctor us, and Bill Nicholson flew out. Um, and uh, that's sort of how this, that's sort of been the beauty of this, uh, this whole journey is this community of uh, common thinkers, the CTO operators. We're really pretty tight-knit community and we're quite generous with each other in terms of sharing our experiences and knowledge and it's, it's been uh, sort of like this perpetual uh, building process that just doesn't end. Wonderful. And so essentially you started by trying yourself to do all these things but then eventually you did have people come over and help you. And, and uh, do you feel that you've, how long did it take you to all this process to feel that you are comfortable tackling CTOs or other complex cases? I think that it's still an ongoing process, right? I think that um, if you're being perfectly honest with yourself, you never become completely comfortable with it, right? And if, if you are completely comfortable with it, then maybe there's a problem, right? These are pretty complex procedures with multiple steps and many opportunities to create complications or issues for the patient. And um, if you don't have a healthy amount of respect for these things, um, then maybe you're not approaching it correctly. I, I still have have uh, this sort of like rehearsal in my mind before a case. Typically, even the night before, it'll kind of come up in my mind, okay, so what are the cases that we're going to do tomorrow? 
have I had a chance to review the films? Who's my fellow tomorrow? We need to make sure we have a plan. Um, that, that still happens to this day. And I think that the, the nerves become a little bit more intense if there's uh, you know, a, a workshop with observers that are going to be in uh, live cases. It obviously catapults from there. But it never goes away completely, right? I think that one of the things that shifts over time and experience is you, you shift from this whole thought of, gosh, if only I had the skills to do this, to more of a, well, I have the skills to do this, and hopefully this anatomy will cooperate, and hopefully there won't be any major complications as we proceed through the case, right? So there's this sort of transition that occurs, and it takes experience, and it's hard to say what an absolute number on that is. I don't know if you have thought yourself on what kind of volume or experience it takes to get to that shift, but there is clearly a shift that occurs, right? And I completely agree. It's different for everyone. And, you know, everyone is trying to quantify this. You know, the European CTO club says you, know, you have to 300 CTOs to feel comfortable. But, I mean, of course, it depends on the cases you do and uh, on how fast you learn. And also, what do you mean by feeling comfortable? As you said, you're never 100% comfortable as well. So do you lo how long do you spend like preparing now? I know you've done so many cases and uh, a lot of experience. So how long do you take to prepare for a case at this point? You know, it, it's sort of like, for me, it takes several, like, passes to finally get to that point where I have a gel plan in my mind. So typically, I'll look at diagnostic films for 15 or 20 minutes if I'm seeing a patient in the office. And then I'll have to mull that over again, maybe over the weekend. Um, and then usually the night before, I'm kind of thinking about it. And in the morning, I, I usually get to the, the hospital pretty early and I review the films on my own. I feel that if I if I can control the film and play the frame by frame playback myself, I just get a little bit more out of it than I do when I have the fellow review the films with me, and then I'll look at the films again with the fellow, and then uh, we'll look at it one final time before we actually time in for the case. So there's probably like a five or six step process for me. I, I really, really am pretty um, OCD about this whole thing. It, it takes me several passes to finally come up with a plan for how I want to approach it. And it hasn't changed. It's it's not changed. I, I feel much more comfortable, more prepared if I've done that. And then, do you now have your preferred techniques? Like, do you approach, you know, are you more on the retrograde side? I know you published this nice paper on undergrade cases and how the filter wires can actually succeed in a pretty large proportion of cases. Uh, has, has that been evolving? Are you still trying to do most of the cases undergrade with soft uh, tapered polymer jacketed wires? How does that work for you? Yeah, I think that obviously the anatomy is really going to dictate the approach, but you know, you've been instrumental in this uh, this uh, global crossing algorithm. I think that 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 um, the globing crossing algorithm sort of touches on some of these points. So the initial North American hybrid algorithm had this 20 millimeter cutoff in terms of how we were going to approach the lesion, right? So as it turns out in many cases, that's relatively arbitrary, and and probing these lesions with a soft jacketed wire often will make a 20 millimeter lesion into a four millimeter lesion, right? And it's really, really hard to predict. And the, the big advantage of these soft tapered wires is they're not really dangerous. They really aren't going to do anything bad to an artery. And everybody in every lab, whether they're C2 or operators or not, know how to do integrated wire escalation. That's what we do every day. So it's a way of trying to uh, more broadly apply uh, treatment of CTOs to maybe less experienced operators. Uh, by promoting at least probing with an integrated soft wire, uh, because uh, as you you know point out in the paper, the success rates naturally drop off with the complexity of the lesion. But the time to cross, if you're going to cross, is actually pretty quick. So you'll find out pretty quickly if it's going to work. And there's really no real downside to doing it. And I find that at least with the fellows, it's a great way to get them started with the thought process of how to select wires and the properties of different wires and what to do when the wire gets extra plaque, uh, how to recognize that it's gone extra plaque, what to do next. Um, and I think that gives them a very high level of confidence that Integrade is, um, in almost all cases, a reasonable way to start, uh, whether or not that's how you ultimately finish the lesion path. So we're big, big proponents of doing Integrade first, uh, even if it's going to be a retrograde case, because we want to have that Integrade wire for the, for the reverse card anyways, or for the ADR. So I, I, I like to do with rare exception, almost everything will be probe integrated. 
Wonderful. And then do you feel that you're getting, um, I know there's been less equipment potentially, but do you think you're changing much the approach lately? Are you learning new techniques, new skills, or do you feel like there's a kind of a plateau in how we approach these lesions? No, I, I, I'm learning constantly. I'm constantly learning. Um, uh, I'll give you a good example. Um, we did a case uh, in early 2017 when I first started at the clinic. It's a patient with um, really ambiguous proximal cap, basically a flush occlusion of his LED. And um, we wired this case uh, retrograde and had a very ambiguous distal cap and really no gear anagrade. This is back in uh, early 17. And honestly, I didn't know how to do Ivis guided puncture at the time. I had no clue how to do it. I knew that it could be done and I'd seen cases being done in uh, courses, but I honestly didn't know how to do that at all. And I failed on that case. And uh, the patient ended up having to have redo bypass surgery. And uh, ironically, he came back uh, this summer with failure of his redo bypass. And uh, it was kind of a nice example to show the fellows, like, look, this is a continuous journey. Five years ago, I didn't know how to do this case. And because I didn't know how to do this case, I made it a point to learn how to do Ivis guided puncture, that that was really a deficiency in my skill set that I needed to have. And so we did this case five years later with an Ivis guided puncture, and it was easy, and, and we got it done, and the patient did really well. Uh, but I think that that's a really great case to share, to explain to people that are earlier on their journey that, look, this is a continuous improvement process. And it starts with being honest with yourself that, you know, maybe you have certain strengths, certain deficiencies. You need to continuously evaluate that and then seek um, additional uh, experience and knowledge from, from others. Uh, as you recognize these deficits. And if you don't, uh, then you won't improve. Perfect. And then are there some, so this is one case that obviously stuck with you and for good reason. Are there other cases that left in your mind, good or bad ones that you remember that have really um, influenced the way you practice? Sure, I mean, I think that everybody has the, the horrendous complication that's occurred that's uh, that you'll never forget, right? Uh, and that's because one error led to another error, which led to a catastrophic issue that, um, you know, those are the things that you unfortunately have to go through, um, hopefully less and less as we gain more experience. Um, but, you know, without getting all the specifics of that stuff, but those things you never forget and, and you hope to never repeat again. And um, I, I think that the, the younger folks that are getting out, they get to go to these uh, complications courses and, uh, you know, they get to see these in pretty uh, PowerPoints, but we had to experience a lot of this stuff, right? And um, you don't forget that kind of stuff, but it's, uh, it's important to recognize those things, to share those with your colleagues, um, and to be open about it, because that's honestly how the entire community improves, and uh, the folks that are uh, earlier on their journey, they, they benefit from all this experience that we've had. Do you get depressed from those sort of cases when a complication happens, or how do you handle these complications? Yeah, I mean it, it's tough, right? I mean it's it's a mental game where you have to uh, you have to um, really uh, be the anchor in the room, right? I mean as these things are happening, everybody's looking at you um, to to get that patient through that case. Um, honestly, you're the only person in that room that honestly has seen enough to know what can be done next. Everyone else is there basically to learn from you or to help support you during the procedure. Uh, but in terms of the overall uh, concept of what's going to happen and what can be done next for that patient, uh, they're pretty much all hanging on you and that patient's depending on you. So um, you have to put the emotion aside and um, take care of the task at hand. And then afterwards, you have to sort of unwrap this, right? And hopefully every, the patient does okay. And um, thankfully here at the clinic, we have this vast team of experts that can help us, uh, you know, care for the patient after we get them out of the lab. So at least that part I can set aside and let other experts deal with. But the, the mental issues of, you know, dealing with the fact that somebody came in on their own two feet this morning, had a procedure with you, and now is in the ICU on a ventilator and a mechanical circulatory support device, you know, you got to, you got to come to grips with that stuff. And it, it's, uh, I don't know if depression is the term I would use, but it certainly gives you um, um, a lot of uh, pause and, and forces you to be thoughtful and reflective about you know what's happened and what you're doing and whether you're doing all the right things 
whether you communicated with the family and the patient effectively before the procedure, um, whether you're being a, a, a very effective team player with all the other providers that are taking care of that patient, um, and setting a good example for the team in the lab, for the fellows, for all the colleagues uh, in your, in your uh, section, uh, that uh, you can deal with that pressure in a productive way and do even better next time, right? That's really what people are looking at you for. And um, that's one of the big challenges. So I don't think I would say that it's depression, but it's definitely uh, one of the challenges that we face in our careers. And uh, people are counting on us. The patients, all the people we're training, all of our colleagues are counting on us um, to be thoughtful and reflective and provide towards improving the whole process for everyone, right? That's the only way that this, this happens. If, if bad things didn't happen, then we would never be forced to find ways to improve things, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. I completely agree with you. And I think on, on many levels, the one is that, you know, you have to stay strong during the case and do the best you can. Also, that it's very nice to be in an environment like yours where you have a lot of support. So if something happens, knock on wood, then you have the intensivist, the advanced heart failure team, uh, the perfusionist, uh, the um, other cardiologists. So you have a lot of team that can take care of these very complex patients and hopefully get them through that, uh, that event. So it is a team sport and it does uh, require collaboration with many people. And as you said, you do the best you can, and uh, hopefully that is um, good enough for the patient to have a good outcome down the line. Yeah. Um, now to but switch the team, to the, the team teaching has part. has a leader, right? Leader, right? What's that? That's true. That's true. And, and you know, and part of it is there's the paralysis sometimes, right? Where things don't go well, quite often there's a paralysis. Things are you know flying back and forth. There's no clear direction of where to go. And you're right, that's where it is important to take charge in a way and in a nice way direct the, the course of the event and try to figure out what is the best way to move forward. Call for help, the people that you need, but coordinate it. So I, I, I completely agree. You know, I had myself a rough week last week on this on this front and I completely agree that this makes a huge difference for the patient and for the final outcome. But if we want to talk about teaching a little bit, because I know you do courses, you have people come and visit you all your time. Um, how do you choose people you train? and? Uh, can you tell if you see someone, this is going to be a good CTO operator, a complex operator, or not? You know, that's a great question because I often wonder about that myself. Like, how did how did we all end up where we ended up? Right? There was no like exam that we took that got us here. Right? There was a sort of a common interest in uh, advancing our skill set in PCI that got us here, and. Um, what I would say is that for our fellows, there's sort of a, a basic skill set for PCI that, that we all are striving to make sure that they leave their training with, uh, that they need to be very, very facile with, with uh, how to engage coronaries, use different guide catheters, troubleshoot problems when there's lack of support, how to use imaging, how to use hemodynamics, how to optimize a PCI result. And, you know, those are sort of like the basic building blocks that all of our fellows are expected to master uh, to be good coronary interventionalists. But then there's always the people that um, are extremely interested in, in um, sort of, uh, I guess, you know, the, the really cool thing about our fellowship is that it's a multidisciplinary fellowship. So these second year fellows that are with us, they do structural, they do congenital intervention, they do peripheral intervention, they do carotid intervention, they do CTO and CHIP. And what I've noticed is that the ones that are really keen on um, sort of cross-pollinating their skill sets, those are the ones that get the most out of doing the CTOs and the CHIP cases because they're taking little pearls here and there and they're applying it towards whatever it is that they're going to ultimately end up doing when they leave uh, to start their careers. And I, I pick up on that because that's definitely how I kind of got into this because I was picking up a pearl from our peripheral attending, a pearl from the carotid attending, a pearl from the person that was doing the BAVs that was there, you know, and, and they've stuck with me and they've informed my practice. And I see that in the younger trainees. And those are the ones that, whether or not they ultimately end up doing CTO or CHIP or whatever they end up doing is, that's kind of the thing that I pick up on, and maybe it's because I identify with it, because that's how I did it. Uh, but I don't like that there's one thing in particular that makes you a CTO or chip operator, but there's that inherent curiosity of how can I integrate different skill sets and techniques to solve a problem. And that's sort of the common theme that I've seen in people that are very successful in this field. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And then, uh, as you say, this is some, fortunately or unfortunately, the cases are, each case is different than each other case. So in a way, you have to do this to be successful regardless. So as you say, the more, the sooner you start doing that, the better it is. Um, how do you do a lot of live cases for meetings and locally? How, li how valuable do you think are those live cases? Do you think they're valuable? Um, are they maybe over, um, overdone or what do you think about live cases? Um, you know, I think that they're invaluable. Without live cases and, um, or even, even cases that aren't live, cases that are curated and placed on, on YouTube, like the ones that you do, um, they are instrumental in, in terms of disseminating this knowledge and skill set. Um, I think that live cases are a unique issue um, in the sense that there's some controversy, particularly at our institution. We don't, we don't do a lot of live case transmission, and that's a policy uh, that's been set by the enterprise. So when we do live cases, they're for workshops that are done in-house when observers come in and, you know, we might transmit to a conference room, uh, but we don't, we don't, uh, transmit to, um, to large meetings. Um, and, and, you know, we don't really have the, the, the time today to go through the pros and cons of that. But in terms of what do people get out of live cases, to see an expert operator have to troubleshoot on the fly and deal with the scenarios as they unravel during a case, that's that's um, that's priceless because you know to see a curated case is one thing. I mean, your cases are amazing because you show us all the pitfalls, all the complications, all all the other issues. So it's never just the idealized case, right? So they're they're amazing. But in a live case, we get to see all of the issues that happen and how that operator was able to maintain composure and get through that. And um, I, I think that that's huge. And and um, I don't think that the the field would be where it is without without those cases. I think that that's how we've all we have to have that model uh, of of this expert operator who's going through the case in real time uh, to to focus in on how we can approach these cases when we do it ourselves. Wonderful. And then, which cases do you find the most valuable? The more complex, the more. Uh, complicated or the ones with actual complications, or uh, even the standard case can be valuable. Uh, do you have any, or it doesn't really matter as long as any case is done in a good way, it can provide lessons? Uh, I watch everybody's cases. I watch the cases that are done here at the clinic, uh, just out of curiosity. I watch your cases that you post on YouTube. I watch cases that are done in the Asia Pacific. I watch cases that are done in Europe. I, I get a lot out of it, honestly. I. I learned how to do parallel wiring by watching other people's cases. I learned how to do IVIS guided uh, reentry using uh, other people's cases. I learned how to do IVIS guided puncture. I learned how to optimize reverse cart. Um, uh, I learned how to do hairpin wiring. I, mean, I, I can go on and on with all the things that I learned just by watching other people who were kind enough to share their cases online. Um, so um, I, I think that that's a, a, a level of generosity that's helping lots and lots of physicians and patients around the world. So I think it needs to continue in one form or another. Perfect. And then uh, I know that you know this is a full-time job and a very intense job. But uh, um, how do you able to maintain the you know level of performance and be fresh for the case and be engaged and be able to do this? Because sometimes you say it can take several hours. They can be tiring and everything else. Uh, what do, what do you do to keep yourself in good shape, both technically but also you know mentally and uh, and psychologically to tackle these cases? Yeah, yeah. I guess you shouldn't take yourself too seriously, right? You have to, uh, you have to keep it all, all in perspective, right? So there's there's life after the cath lab, but you know when you're in the cath lab, uh, your responsibilities for that patient and um, getting them through the procedure safely. But you know you have to have fun. Um, so we play music in our room. Um, I, I'm a real classic rock fan, so we have uh, music in our room constantly, um, and. Um, the fellows pick music, I pick music, but we, we, we enjoy having that sort of fellowship in the room, um, that it's not all just seriousness. Um, so that's in the lab itself. Um, we have a lot of fun, and I think that the patients appreciate that vibe as well, that we're not just cold and serious, that we're, we're, we're people and we're a team, and uh, I think that that shows, and that positive energy, I think it, it fills the room and it, it helps the patient get through the procedure. Um, so that's in in the lab itself, you know. Outside of work, um, you know, standing around for that many hours, whether or not you have lead or whether you have rampart, just standing for that long is is physically draining, right? So, 
you know, I, I try really hard to remain physically fit. I work out four to five times a week uh, with weight training and with aerobics. Um, I do a lot of stretching as well. Um, so that's sort of, you know, how I keep my body in shape. Um, and then as far as what else, you know, I, I think that if you're not doing other things outside of medicine, then, then you know, you're kind of... Um, I, I think it's important to have other things, right? Um, and, and all of us have our own interests. You can see behind me, I, I love taking photographs. So, you know, these are, these are some pictures I took in southern France and in Paris. Um, here's a picture, I'm going to embarrass my kids, a picture I took um, really one morning in Florence in Italy. Um, so I, I love doing this. This is, this is what I get a lot out of. Uh, it's a it's a kind of a cool way of of combining you know all of our interest in technology and gadgetry you know the cameras are so amazing what they can do so you get to play with these really cool technical toys but then you know you have to use your artistic side as well to turn that image into something that you can you know proudly display on a wall and um, it's a lot of fun it's a way to use your right brain and your left brain and I find it really, really relaxing. I, I really enjoy doing that a lot. That's my that's my big passion. So did you learn to do that on the side? Did you just start taking pictures? Did you go some courses? Did you get some teachers? Does Reddit how do you learn photography? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I learned it like a lot like how I learned CTOs, quite honestly. Yeah. So uh, uh, when my kids were really younger, we hired professional photographers to come take pictures of them and I bugged the crap out of these guys. They were like my Bill Lombardi. And uh, I said, look, I promise you I'm going to buy prints from you guys, but you got to let's let's hire you for a couple of hours just to show me how you do what you do. And they thought that was really weird, but then they actually agreed to do it. And I actually had them, uh, you know, spend spend several hours with me just to show me how to compose pictures. And then, like, uh, you know, I use YouTube uh, to watch people's cases. I use YouTube to understand how to uh, to uh, optimize my images and do the post processing. And uh, it's a similar journey. It's a similar journey. Obviously, it's a different product, but uh, same idea. Well, I guess uh, maybe learning spills to other areas, right? You learn to do CTOs or complex cases. You learn photography. But, you know, life is learning in general. So learning how to learn more efficiently might be a good way, I guess. And that's uh, actually what th this is all about. Um, do you have any... Uh, favorite um, books that you that you are inspired of that you're referring to more often you know honestly I don't read a lot of medical books if that's what you're referring to I certainly keep in t keep in uh, you know keep up to date on the literature but I do a lot of, uh, of fiction reading and um, uh, I read this book recently uh, called uh, no country by Killian Ray this book is just so cool it's, it's a book about um, uh, some kids in Ireland um, in, in, in like the 1700s and it follows these kids and their descendants as they migrated throughout the world and it sort of weaves in historical facts with the fiction of their stories as these descendants migrated to South Asia and Africa and North America and uh, it was just a really cool book. I really, really enjoyed reading that. and. Um, I'm a real history buff, and to have the history woven into this fiction, it was just absolutely fascinating. And uh, that's one of the other things that I really like to do is read. Perfect. And then, do you have any favorite movie? Favorite movie? Gosh, you know, I I watched a movie on. I, I just flew home from a meeting in Chile, and. Um, I watched a movie on Netflix about Carlos Ghosn and his whole issue um, managing two auto companies on two different continents. I don't know if that's my favorite movie, but that's the most recent movie that I watched. I don't watch a lot of TV. I had to be trapped on an airplane to do that, uh, but that movie was pretty fascinating. Uh, again, I think yes, I like I like having uh, uh, historical facts woven into the story, so that that was a pretty cool movie to watch. Wonderful. And then, what are you most proud of, both in medicine and outside medicine? Gosh, um, you know, at the risk of sounding cliche, I, mean, I think I'm most proud of what I've done with my family, my kids. Uh, my wife and I have four kids. 
uh, which also is kind of an interesting story. So uh, we had triplet daughters when I was a cardiology fellow. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Congratulations. <Yeah. laughs> Three in one. So that's, that's amazing. That's where the story ends. So we had triplet daughters when I was a cardiology fellow, and 16 months later we had one more. So we had a boy 16 months later. So uh, you know, fellowship was a really interesting time because we were really, really busy at home with all of these little babies, and my parents thankfully were very gracious to come and help us with that. And um, so that's been a continuous journey. I mean, three of them are now in college. My, my youngest is a senior in high school. Uh, so to watch them um, flourish and do well and go on to their higher academic learning, it, it's been an amazing, amazing um, thing to watch and to, to, to have provided for that. That's certainly what I'm most proud of. At work, I would say, you know, uh, being part of this amazing team, I'm really proud of it. Uh, it, it's an amazing place to work, and the fellows are so, so um, uh, appreciative of what we do. I, I, I've won Teacher of the Year Award three years uh, that I've been here. I've only been here since 17. I've already won this three times, so it's sort of like this mutual admiration club, and I love the fellows, and they seem to love me, so it's, I'm really proud of that. I'm really proud of the teaching that we do. Is there any of your any of your kids interesting in uh, cardiology or CT or anything, or are they turned off by the intensity of the process? I, I have one one daughter who who seems to be really really keen on medicine. Um, the others are sort of uh, sort of undifferentiated at this point, but one is really really gung ho on medicine. So we'll see. And how were you able to balance? As you say, I mean, I mean, we have two, and that seems like. Hard to manage too. I mean, four I cannot imagine. That's not that's double, but it's actually exponential in terms of intensity. So, how was were you yeah. able to balance all the demands of a you know very busy uh, clinical practice and academic practice along with um, with raising a family? Yeah, I mentioned it. So, I, I don't think that any of this would have been possible without my parents helping. I mean, they 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 raised my kids for us. Uh, they they did everything that we couldn't do and. You know, for, for a while there, I was actually entertaining not doing an interventional fellowship because it just was a little too much. And my parents called and they said, look, uh, under no circumstances are you going to not do an interventional fellowship, and we're going to do whatever it takes to help you guys get this through. And uh, they've, they've done all the stuff that we were not able to do, so uh, I owe them uh, an unrepayable debt of gratitude for that. Absolutely. And obviously you are very young and very early in, in the career, but do you have any thoughts for afterwards? How long will you do this for another 10, 20, 30, 40 years? That's a great question. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I firmly believe I'm leaving on a high note, right? Um, I, I think that, you know, there's certainly uh, a lot of physical demands that this job puts on you, and uh, I'll be 50 next year. I, I think that's still quite young, but at a certain point, you know, the, the, your back hurts, your shoulders hurt, your vision is starting to fail a little bit, the near accommodation is gone, and um, you know, as long as it's fun and people are enjoying what you're teaching them and they're getting something out of it, I think I would be motivated to continue to do this, but you know, at some point this sort of tilts the other way, right? So it's physically a little too demanding, uh, it, it's hurting too much. Uh, you know, I, thankfully I haven't had any major health issue related to this, but I know many friends have, and uh, I'm always cautious about that. So I, I think that there is, unfortunately, an expiration date on doing this type of work. What it is exactly, I don't know, but I certainly keep uh, keep that in mind as I, as I um, move forward. I think that what I really like about what I do now is the opportunity to kind of fiddle and play with other people's tools and techniques and perfect them for what I want to do. And, you know, maybe in the future there'll be an opportunity to do this in a more formal way, be it for some sort of a, a startup company or even a large uh, corporation. Who knows? Uh, but the, the, the thing that I really like is playing with other people's toys and figuring out how to break them or how to make them do even cooler things. And uh, I think there'll be an opportunity in the future when I don't think I can do this type of work physically to do something analogous to this. Um, and, and the teaching side of it hopefully will continue indefinitely. I, I love the teaching and I think, I think that that's uh, a skill set that uh, you can maintain without physically doing the case. Wonderful. So can you uh, 
just give your like last piece of advice for the fellows who are interested in this, people who want to learn to do complex and CTO PCI. If you had to summarize the things that are the most important for them, what would you say? I think that the themes we touched on, but uh, number one, be honest, be generous, be curious, be open, be a leader, um, and, and you'll have fun and you'll be very successful at this. Um, that, that, that's been my guiding principles and it's, it has served me certainly quite well. And I think it would be um, pretty similar to many of us uh, that are all friends. And, and I guess that's maybe one of the other points that I would make is that you know, we are a tight-knit community. I mean, any one of us can call each other at any time and we'll help. And uh, it's, it's, so, uh, it's such a privilege to know that I have friends on basically every continent that I can call at any time and they'll, they'll help me. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's irreplaceable. And I think that people that adhere to these principles, they'll be part of this club. Wonderful. Well, Jay, again, thank you so much. I know that it's been uh, an amazing journey. You created an amazing program at uh, Cleveland Clinic. And many people have learned and will continue to learn from you in the years to come, including myself. So again, thank you so much for taking the time today. And I uh, really appreciate your insights and look forward to meeting you at the next uh, uh, in-person meeting. Sounds good. Thanks again, Manos. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Sensei Podcast. 